Hello. If you have not already watched this video, A Brief History of Numerical Systems by Alessandra King, I recommend you go to our course's Canvas page and then find this video linked in the modules. It's a good overview of this entire chapter. Once you've finished watching that, then return back to this video. A bit of definitions that we'll want to know is whenever we talk about the current number system we use, anything that you've been using in your daily life, that is known as the Hindu Arabic system. So oftentimes in problems, you might see it phrased as translate this to the Hindu Arabic system. Just reference that into your mind as our number system. Okay, so that's just a phrasing that we might use there. And Based on historical um, research and analysis, historians have been able to determine how previous civilizations expressed and counted things and their different numbering systems. In this chapter, we're going to review some of the various numbering systems from past civilizations. To begin with, we're going to talk about the early Egyptian symbols. For the number one, the symbol used is very similar to R1. Okay. Now, in the Egyptian symbols, there wasn't a 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, but instead it went to 10. So if we wanted to represent the number 2, we would just have to draw two ones. If we wanted to represent the number 3, we would have to draw three ones. Okay. And if we wanted to represent the number 10, it's this upside down U. So if we wanted to represent the number 14, we would draw the larger item first, so the 10 first, and then four ones. The remaining symbols are 100, is this kind of scrolly squiggle. You would draw that by starting here maybe, and then drawing out. Okay. For 1,000, it was this flower. There's many ways to draw it, but one way might be to kind of in a continuous way, go down, across, up, and then something like that. With these, we just want to make sure it's relatively distinguishable, but don't worry about drawing them perfectly. 10,000 was this pointing finger, 100,000 is this fish, and then 1 million is this. For this symbol, you could draw this. And with the Egyptian symbols, if we wanted to express 2,000, we would need to have 1,000 plus 1,000. So since there's not a symbol in itself for 2,000, we just repeat the symbol for 1,000 twice. In this example, we're asked to translate this number expressed here into Hindu Arabic number form. And just remember, Hindu Arabic number form is our system. So we'll want to reference our chart. And the Egyptian symbols, we write the largest increments to the left. So we see that we have two 10,000 figures. So this would add up to be 20,000, because it's two 10,000s, plus one, two, three, four, five, five 1,000 figures. So these are going to be grouped to be 5,000. And one thing to note here with the Egyptian symbols, notice some of these are stacked on top of each other. There's no meaning for that. It's just instead of writing five out left to right, which would take a lot of space, you can feel free to stack them vertically, but there's no difference in meaning, whether they were written vertically or horizontally. Okay. Next, we translate our next set of symbols. Two of the scrolls, which are each 100. So that would add up to be 200 plus, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six of the 10 elements. So that'd be 60 plus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight of the single digits one. Now we can, with our calculator, add these all together and we would get our final answer. And we would get 25,268. And within this entire set of notes for this chapter, we are going to work from translating from their system to ours, and also from our system to theirs. And I think we might see that in our upcoming examples. In this example, we're asked to take a number in our system 
and translate it to an Egyptian number. So we would begin thinking about how could we express this number in terms of powers of 10. 1, 10, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000. And this is actually going to come up later in the notes when we learn about expanded form, so we can practice doing that here as well. We would first phrase this as 300,000 plus 70,000 plus 6,000 plus 200 plus 40 plus 8. So if it helps, we could express 376, 248 as equal to 3 times 100,000 because the 3 is in the hundreds thousandths place plus 7 times 10,000 because the 7 is in the ten thousands place plus six times a thousand continuing on here plus two times one hundred plus four times ten plus eight times one and the reason breaking down this number in this way might be helpful to us is now we can see each of the ten thousand one hundred thousand one thousand one hundred ten and one each have these various symbols, and we know exactly how many of each of these to draw. So I need to draw three of the symbols that represent 100,000. So looking here, 100,000 is this fish. So I'm going to draw the fish like this. And just so I can conserve space a little, I'm going to draw my third one below. We know in the Egyptian symbol, it doesn't matter where they're drawn, just matters that there's three of them. We've gotten that taken care of. Next. We see that 10,000 is represented by this pointing finger. We need to draw seven of those. Okay, four, maybe three below. Okay. Next, we want to draw six of the figures that represents a thousand. So we draw six of these flowers. Finally, we need to draw two of the scrolls for 200, four of these for the tens, so 40, and then eight of the ones. Great. So now we have expressed our answer in Egyptian numerals. In this example, we are going to subtract two numbers written in Egyptian form. Referencing here, we see that the squiggle is the 100. And the way we would subtract these is much like how we subtract in our own system. For instance, there is one, two, three, four ones that we're subtracting from seven ones. So what we could do is we could say, well, if we subtract these four, that takes away these four, and we know that we're left with three ones. Whenever we subtract this one heel bone from these four heel bones, we see we're left with three heel bones. Whenever we subtract these three scrolls from these five scrolls, we're left with two scrolls. And that would be our answer. And if you ever want to check your work in these problems, you could translate each of these numerals to our system and then just double check the subtraction works out. So for instance, this is 547 minus 314. In your calculator, you can verify what this is and make sure that these are the same number, just expressed in different formats. And indeed, in both cases, we see this is 233 in our system and 233 in the Egyptian system. Let's look at our next problem. As we begin to work this problem again, just like before we'd say, okay, I want to subtract these four ones from these two ones. But here we would see a problem. And just like before, if we were subtracting in our numbers, if we were taking two away from four, we would realize we couldn't do that immediately without borrowing from the next largest placeholder because you need to have more things so that you can take those away. 
What we're going to do here then is we can't change the value of this top number, but we can rearrange how it's expressed. So currently we've got three, or sorry, four tens. But what if we get rid of one of the tens here? Now we can't change the value of the number, so we've got to add in the same 10 just somewhere else. But if we express it as one, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. What's really happened is this one ten has been re-expressed into single digits. So the value of the number on top is still the same. But the reason we want to do this is now we can actually take away four things since there's now more than four things above. This is the idea of borrowing that you might have done whenever you took away um, from the next digit. You took, you reduced it down by one and brought it over. That's the idea the same here. So we now are going to take for the four ones that we have, we will get rid of these four ones and we're left with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight remains. And now whenever we subtract the next stuff, the sets of 10, we no longer have four sets of 10 above, we have three. And we're subtracting two of these. So we take away these two, and we're left with just one heel bone remaining. Oh, I apologize. I should not write this as our number eight. I should write it as their number eight. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Value's the same, but I need to express it in the Egyptian format one heel bone left, and then we subtract the scroll. There was two, we take one away, and we're left with one. And we can check our work, so going back to how these numerals started, the top number is 242, and we were subtracting 124. And in both cases, we would get 118, whether expressed in their system or ours. The next historical number system that we're going to look at is Roman numerals. Roman numerals have these basic symbols. 1, 5 is a capital V, 10 is a capital X, 50 is a capital L, 100 is a capital C, 500 is a capital D, and 1000 is a capital M. In addition to these expressions, Roman numerals have a little bit more special features. They've got what's called the subtractive feature. Now, normally in Roman numerals, you always write from largest number from the left to smallest number at the right. And if you ever switch that order, it's intentional and it actually means something. So for instance, we're going to look at how to express the number four and how to express the number six. Let's start with six. We see that there's not an express symbol for six, but there is one for five and there is one for one. So if we write the V and then the one symbol, that's five plus one is six. And notice here we go from bigger number to smaller number. So the normal er order is preserved. And if we think about it, if we're trying to now express four, four is just one less than five. So instead of writing one, two, three, four, the Romans decided that since you're only one away from five, if you write one V, here we see the order is switched, so we've got smaller number and then bigger number. What that means is whenever a smaller symbol comes before a bigger symbol, you're supposed to subtract them. So this is expressing take the five and subtract one from it. That gives you the value of four. So whenever you're looking at Roman numerals express, you first need to ask yourself, are they in order largest to smallest? If not, realize anything that's out of order has this implied subtractive feature where you take the larger number and you subtract the smaller number to see what it represents. We're also going to express 12, okay? Looking here, we've got the 10, so we could write the X. We still need to account for two ones, so we would draw a one one. If we were expressing 14, we would have the X. And then instead of drawing four ones, since we're so close to the 15, we're just one away, we would draw the IV. So that's 10 plus four. 
whereas 16 would be xvi. So before we look at our next example of 49, we're just going to look at the details of the subtractive feature that we've been talking about. Not only do we have what we talked about before, where if you write a smaller number before a larger number, you subtract them, and that's how we get 4, there's additional rules that you can't do that with any digits. The digit for 1 can only go in front of the digit for 5 or the digit for 10. So I can't put the digit of 1 in front of 50 and make it 49. That didn't work within their system. So for instance, I could write IV for 4, I could write IX for 9, but I could not write IL for 49. That was not accepted. But we could have the 10 come before the L, which would make something like 40, so we could have XL, which is 40, whereas LX, if we wrote in the correct numerical order, would be 60. Okay. And the 10 could also come before the 100 symbol, C, and then the C symbol could only precede the 500 symbol or the 1000 symbol. Now, as we express 49, we realize that 40 is very close to 50. It's just one 10 away, and we know that the 10 symbol can come before the 50 symbol to express 40. So we would start by saying, well, you first have to have 40. So that would be x comes before l to show the subtraction. 50 minus 10 is 40. And then we still have to express the nine single digits left. So we would say that we want 10 minus 1 would give us 9. So that would be i x. Okay. And these numbers are always written left to right. So the way we would read this if we were just given this numeral and we had to translate it back to our system, I would start by recognizing that x is a smaller digit than l. So that's an intended subtractive feature. So I would think of this as 50 minus 10. Similarly, i comes before x is an inti intentional misorder. So that's a subtractive feature. So x is 10 minus this digit is 1. And that's what would give us our 40 plus 9 is 49. Now for 75, we look at which of these symbols gets us as close as we can to 75. And we'd see that would be the symbol for 50L. So this accounts for 50. We got to account for 25 remaining. So then we could take two tens. So you just express xx is 20. So that accounts for 50 plus 10 plus 10 is 70. There's five left, so we would account for the last five with the v. And notice here it's all in descending order, largest to smallest. For 101, we've got the symbol c would give us 100 exactly. Now we're only missing the digit 1, so we would add in to the right of the C, the digit 1, and that would be 101. So the Roman system doesn't just have the basic base 10 numerals 1, 10, 100, 1000. It also has digits for 5, 50, and 500. This allows less repetition whenever we write out problems. It's got the subtractive feature, which we've already discussed, and then it's got a multiplicative feature. Instead of having more symbols past 1,000, you notice that we stopped at 1,000 as our last symbol. If we want to show values higher than 1,000, we would put a bar over the numeral up to 10,000. Or not up to 10,000, it works for all values. Sorry for that misspeak. So let's go through an example of A. If we were going to express 27,142 in Roman numerals, we would be able to express the 142 relatively easily. The 27,000 is going to be the issue, so I might first think of this as 27,000 plus 142. Definitely, if you check in your calculator, these are the same things, but it just allows us to think of them as, okay, how could we deal with the 27,000? And we already know how to deal with the 142 that we're going to add to that. Now, 27,000 is the same as 27 times 1,000. You can verify this in your calculator. 
So the number that we're trying to express is the same as 27 times 1,000 plus 142. So in the Roman feature, if you have a bar over the numeral, that means multiply by 1,000. So if I can express the digit for 27, and I just have a bar over the top of that symbol, that's going to indicate that you take the 27 and you multiply by the 1,000, giving us the value for 27,000. Why don't you take a moment to pause this video and write down the Roman numeral for 27, and then unpause and we'll show that we draw the bar over it to show multiplication by 1,000. So we have the symbol for 27, and then we draw a bar over this entire symbol to show that all of 27 is being multiplied by 1,000, and then we just add in the writing for 142. I recommend you pause the video and attempt to write out 142 on pause and see if you got the right answer. So 142 is CXLII, so the reason being is C is 100. XL, the order is switched, so we've got 50 minus 10, which is 40, so 142. Okay, and that would be the Roman numeral for 27,142. Now, if you've got a double bar, that means multiply by a million. So if we were expressing 27 million, we would write that as the number for 27, XXVII, with two bars, and that would be 27 million. In this example, we have that a Roman official had 26 servants, and he excused 13 of them. How many are still in the home? Now definitely we know just from our mental calculations the answer is going to be 13. But let's practice going through working with the Roman symbols just for practice of how this could have been done using their terminology. So we are trying to write the problem 26 minus 13 because that's the operation that we're doing in our head to find this answer. Let's translate that to Roman numerals. So for 20 we would have, looking at our symbol chart, that 26 minus 13. Now again, we're going to look at like things, so we would be first thinking about, well, what is three ones minus the only one that we have there? In this case, we're going to have to borrow, so we need to re-express the top number as something that has more ones available to it. So you would look, the next largest numeral to the left is the 5. So let's re-express the 5. Instead of the V, we're going to add five ones here. One, two, three, four, five. So the top number is still the same. It's still 26. 10 plus 10 plus 6. But now it's in a form that we can use. We're going to subtract three of the ones here. And we see that we're left with one, two, three. We take one of the x's away from the two x's. And we get a single x. And we get 13 as we expected in both representations. Our last historical number system from this section is the Chinese numerals. Now the Chinese number system had symbols for every digit between 1 and 10. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. They also had a digit for 100, 1,000, and 0. Let's first just go through how to draw these symbols first, and then we'll go through how these symbols were actually combined together to make larger numbers. The symbol for 1 is just kind of a regular squiggle there. Two, we've got a smaller kind of tilted shape here with a larger one under it. Three, similar to the two, it's just another one on top. Four, we might draw like a little box here first and then add in these. Okay, And with all these, it's not about being perfect, just about being reasonably close where it's distinguishable. The next one, 6, getting a little askew here, 6 would be this, okay. 7 would be kind of an elongated T, 8, it's very much like a lambda symbol, 9, 10, 100, okay, 1,000, 
and then zero is the more complicated one. I just draw a few squiggles at the top and then a line going vertically down. Okay, so something like that. It's very distinguishable from the other symbols. This is the first system that we've seen of the Egyptian and the Roman that actually had something for zero. So in this system, we've actually got a number to represent zero. And then the Chinese symbols, another thing to note is they are written from top to bottom. So we've got our larger symbols down to the smallest symbols, the unit symbols. So we'll be looking vertically. And another interesting thing about this system is it's written in pairs. For instance, if I want to express 50, I wouldn't write this five times, which is quite repetitive, takes a lot of space. Instead of writing this, if I'm trying to express 50 in the Chinese symbol, I would take the fact that I know I need five times 10. So I would find the digit for five, this one here, and then I'd find the digit for 10 and write it below. And this is kind of like a number pair. We would translate this to five times 10, and that would give us our 50. If instead we wanted to write 54, we would start the same, we would have the same pairing here, the digit times how much you multiply it by, so five times 10. That gives us 50. We've still got to count for the four, so the single digit goes here. We find the digit for four, and we express that here, and that would be 54. So with the Chinese symbol, it always works in pairs until the last digit is going to be one of the digits one through nine if it appears, and then you would just leave that by itself. It's not with the pair because it's just saying there's just four things, not four times something. So in this example, we're asked to express 614 as a Chinese numeral. So 614, it might be helpful to think of that as there's a six in the hundreds place. So 614 is equal to six times 100 plus there's a one in the one hundreds place, or sorry, in the tens place, one times 10, plus just four single digits. And this will help us write our numbers in the Chinese number pair. So you first start at the largest pairing, six times 100. So we would find the symbol for six. Let's see, it's this one. We would draw that to the best of our abilities. That's six. And then to show that it's times 100, you find the symbol for 100 and you write that right underneath. So we could, in our mind, translate this to 6 times 100. Okay. We've got that taken care of. Now we do 1 times 10. So the symbol for 1 is here. Symbol for 10 is here. This pairing represents 1 times 10. And then we just write our final digit of 4 here. And here we have expressed 614. So these kind of brackets that I put were just to help me see the pairs. It's not part of the numeral, but if it helps you as kind of work off to the side, feel free to do it. Now, we've talked through these first two features in our earlier examples. Let's just talk about this last feature then. If we've got a power of a base missing, that means if there's not a tens place, a hundreds place, or a thousands place, to represent that that's just not part of the number, you would write the zero symbol in its place. So if you see some values and then the zero number and then more, that means that you've skipped a power of the base where it's just not present. I believe we can see that in our example B here. Looking at the symbols, we see that we've kind of got this first pairing here and then the zero symbol, and then our final digit three. First, we see this elongated T represents the seven. So this is the same as seven times, this is the 100. So we've got seven times 100. And then next, we would expect to see the ten space represented. But since there's the zero symbol here, that means that we're not multiplying by 10 anything. It's just zero times 10, which is zero. So that shows us we completely don't have anything in the tens place. And then we add in the final digit of three. So this would translate to the number 703. 
I recommend you take a moment to try to find what the A example represents in our number system. Pause the video, work on translating it with our number systems that we have here, and then unpause to see if you got the correct answer. Now with this, I like to start by just working on the, we know that Chinese numbers work in pairs. So I've got these two, these two, these two. The last digit is always by itself. Now we look at our symbols. This is the symbol for three times the symbol for a thousand plus the symbol for one times a hundred plus the symbol for six times ten plus just the single digit for four. We could multiply and add these in our calculator and we would get that this is going to be three thousand one hundred and sixty four. Okay. Let's look at our examples for C and D next. I recommend you pause the video and attempt C and then unpause to check your work. So here we work with pairs top to bottom so we've got this times this. Now we see we've got the symbol zero, which means we skip bases in between and we've only got one symbol remaining below, that would be the single digits. This looks like the symbol for, so we have five times, this symbol is for a thousand. Notice the slight difference between the symbol for a ten and a thousand. The thousand has the extra symbol at the top. Okay. Normally we would expect then to have hundred symbols and ten symbols. But instead we've got the zero with no other symbols coming after it except the single digit. So then we just say plus zero plus this is the symbol for nine. So our answer is going to be five thousand and nine. In our last answer we've got these two pairings here. So we have four times one thousand plus two times 100 and unlike before notice we don't have any trailing single digits so this number just represents 4000 plus 200 which would be 4200 written like that so in the case where there's no single digits for instance not like 4201 4202 if we just went 4200 then we don't need to write the zero symbol at the bottom the zero symbol is only used whenever we are skipping bases in between. So posted to Canvas, there will be a formula sheet that has all of the basic symbols that we've been looking at compiled into one sheet. If you have access to a printer, you might want to print that out. If not, you could copy it on your own paper to have a formula sheet to use as you go through the homework. I think it would be beneficial instead of flipping back and forth between our notes to find all the different symbols. Thank you.